welcome to the, to Presenza, welcome to the space of women who build the future. Welcome home. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and thank you for being here. Gemma Bird is a senior lecturer at the University of Liverpool, United Kingdom. Her research has recently focused on migration, citizenship, and all the ways in which the activism and the scholarship can be connected. She has published books and articles about different topics, Kantian um, political thought, cross-cultural um, dialogue, and African political theory. Um, Gemma, <laughs> you are a teacher, mm -hmm. a researcher, and an activist. How do these three fields connect? What do they have in common? Okay, um, thank you. So yes, I think that for me, scholarship is a way of being an activist. Um, a way of embodying activism um, and a way of using a platform that I have um, to raise awareness of things that are happening in the world, um, to share space, to make space for other people's stories um, and for other people's voices. Uh, and teaching is also a way of doing that as well as of sharing the research that I do um, of sharing um, other people's stories with my students um, and of challenging students to think differently about the world in which we find ourselves. Um, challenging the status quo, um, challenging kind of ingrained received knowledge um, and hoping that that will in some way make a difference um, and in some way challenge the situation in which we find ourselves. Um, so yeah, I, th I think they integrate very well. Um, and for me, academia is one way of doing activism. Um, there are plenty of others, um, but this is the approach that I've taken so far. Yeah, thank you. It's very interesting, this connection. And what have motivated you and what continue to motivate you to engage in the fields you have chosen? Um, I think that point about stories um, that I made is probably really key to this. It's about finding a way to ethically share stories and finding a way uh, for people to engage with them. And I guess that's also quite important for journalism as well. How do we tell the stories um, that are occurring in the world and what does that allow us to do and does that allow us to make space for people to use their own voice um, and that that isn't about us dominating or being in control of what gets told but creating an environment in which um, people can tell their own story and hopefully that we can change the conditions that people face um, because I work a lot on the conditions facing refugees um, and in particular in Greece and I know you've done other interviews on this topic, um, but I think what is really important for me and what motivates me to carry on with this research is that the situation is appalling and it doesn't have to be. We talk about a refugee crisis as if it is in some way inherent to Europe. Um, but the reality is that it's a crisis only if we allow it to be a crisis. It's a crisis only because of how Europe responds and the UK now we've left the European Union. Um, so it's also a humanitarian issue, it's not a European issue. Um, so I think for me what motivates my current work is challenging that, is trying to suggest that this received knowledge that there exists a refugee crisis is in fact false. And what is wrong is that humanitarian, the, we haven't responded 
properly to humanitarian needs in a way that Europe, the UK, America are very capable of doing. And you have spent uh, some weeks and perhaps months in Samos, in the Greek island of Samos. And now I know that you would like to go there, but it's very difficult in this moment. But can you tell us something about this experience briefly? Yeah. Um, so I've spent time in Samos um, as well as in Lesbos and Chaos and Kos, um, which are for the other five um, hotspot islands as they get referred to. Um, as well as in Serbia and Athens and Thessaloniki. And I think people don't necessarily realize anymore that people are living in the conditions they're living in and that these conditions result from a choice that is made at a political level, that there is a choice made by the European Union or by the Greek government to maintain conditions that are not suitable for people. Um, there is a choice to embed policies such as um, the EU Turkey deal that mean that people remain stuck um, on these islands for lengthy periods of time. And I think it is when you see that and you see what is happening to people that you recognize that there really is an alternative and that the conditions that we witness, whereby people are dehydrated in the summer, um, often suffering from rat bites and snake bites, or sheltered in tents in the winter um, when it's freezing cold, with lengthy queues to have access to food that is often inedible. You would never choose to put people in those conditions if we knew about them. And I think the more people know, the more we can do to challenge political decisions, because those political decisions are a choice. Um, and it is only when people respond to politics and push back on politicians that we'll see an improvement. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and so far, we have talked about the present. But this series of interview is called Women Who Build the Future. So can you describe for us the future you aspire to? Um, yeah, so I think I would say that we need a world that isn't based on borders um, and walls, but rather one that recognizes the, the fact that the place of our birth is very much a matter of luck um, and that it creates these false hierarchies and they're hierarchies based on passports, based on race, based on gender um, and that they don't need to exist because we need to challenge that um, and learn to work in solidarity, not in charity. We need to work to stand, to stand shoulder to shoulder with people um, not to offer things downwards, but to say, actually, we are all equal and we all have a right to be heard and to stand in solidarity um, and to challenge those positions of hierarchy, whether they are hierarchy established by states, hierarchies established by the concept of charity, um, but solidarity allows us to challenge that, to challenge racialized, gendered borders um, and the harm that they do. And I think that that is the future we need to aim towards. And that whilst academia isn't necessarily um, doing particularly well itself, and actually it needs to be better as well, because academia needs to recognize its colonial past. Um, the fact that the institutions of academia are often built on a colonial history um, and that they are built on marginalizing and silencing certain voices. Um, and not everybody's story gets told, but because some people 
are actively silenced by the systems we live in. So I think we need to challenge power structures within education, within the state, within global institutions, um, and get to a point where we can change this um, and we can change a system that has marginalized and silenced people um, along racial and gender lines, as well as various other inequalities for a very long time. And that is, I think, the need to challenge the system we are in. So we get to a point where solidarity isn't just a word that is used by politicians, but that doesn't really mean anything. And that solidarity actually means what it should, which is to stand side by side with people and to work together um, for a better world. Yeah. Thank you, Gemma. No, thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing these experiences, these thoughts, this image of academic that are not really dry, isolated people, but people who care for the world and are active. I think this image is very important to share. And I thank you for giving us this possibility to know that there are different kinds of academics, young ones and women. So this is really very encouraging. And so thank you and good work. Thank you very much.